Good morning and welcome to this, the fifth and final day of the Federal Society National Lawyers Convention. I'm Dean Reuter, Vice President, General Counsel, and Director of Practice Groups at the Federalist Society. I'm very pleased to welcome you back today as we close out the convention with three very strong panels. I hope this is a return welcome and that you've been able to join us throughout the week for the entire convention. Even if not, every moment of the convention has been archived and is available on the Federal Society's website in a friendly video format. Turning to today for our closing panel hours from now, we'll have a discussion on emergency powers and the rule of law that could not be more timely, frankly. We'll also check in today with agency leaders from the Treasury Department, the Securities and Exchange Commission, and the Office of the Comptroller Currency on cryptocurrency, bit chain, and central bank digital currency. First though, to get us started today, our opening panel will discuss the Second Amendment. Interestingly, Justice Alito's address last night included a section on the Second Amendment, and he noted that some consider the Second Amendment a second tier constitutional right. I'm sure we'll hear more about that momentarily from our panel. I'm especially pleased to welcome and introduce our moderator, Judge Thomas Hardiman. Judge Hardiman has been a Third Circuit judge for the Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit for over a decade, 13 years now, in fact. He brings a unique view to the appellate bench as prior to his appointment, he served on the federal district court. Before serving on the bench, he held a variety of legal positions, including at major law firms. He grew up though in the family business, driving a taxi cab. And I believe he was the first person in his family to graduate from college and then of course, law school. My own grandfather, a small businessman himself, loved me dearly, but I'm sure he never forgave me for going to law school myself. With that, Judge Hardiman, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dean. Um, I'm not sure my family feels uh, the same way about me going to law school. I think they were glad to see it happen, but uh, unfortunately, no one took over the family business, but welcome. Uh, it's great to uh, be with you all, unfortunately not in person, but uh, great to be with you nonetheless. As always, we have a distinguished panel here for this one on the Second Amendment. I'm going to introduce our panelists briefly, and then they're going to give opening statements, as always, followed by interaction among the panelists, uh, and then we'll conclude with questions from the audience. A uh, couple of housekeeping matters. There is a password that I'll be giving later in the presentation for those of you getting CLE credit. And for those who wish to ask questions, please use the raise hand function uh, on the Zoom call. So without further ado, <clears throat> our panelists. First, we're gonna hear from Professor Mark W. Smith. He's a presidential scholar and a senior fellow in law and public policy at the King's College in New York City. A New York Times bestselling author of a number of books, Professor Smith has lectured at Harvard and Yale Law Schools and Princeton University. Following his graduation from New York University Law School in 1995, Professor Smith served as a law clerk to the Honorable D. Brooke Bartlett on the U.S. District Court for the Western District of Missouri. He later worked as an associate for Skadden Arps and then as a partner at Kasowitz, Benson, Torres and Friedman, LLP. In 2007, Professor Smith founded the law firm of Smith Velier, which in 2015 was named the small law firm of the year in New York City by Smart CEO Magazine. Our second presenter today will be John Ollendorf. He received a JD from Harvard Law School, magna cum laude in 2010, where he was an editor of the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy. Mr. Ollendorf clerked for Judge Raymond Grunder of the United States Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit. And he taught at Northwestern University School of Law as an Olin Searle Smith Fellow, and then at Georgetown University Law Center as a visiting lecturer and fellow at that law school's Center for the Constitution. Mr. Ollendorf's articles have been published in the Notre Dame Law Review, the Georgia Law Review, and the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy. Since 2014, Mr. Ollendorf has been attorney at the law firm of Cooper and Kirk, PLLC, 
where he has been heavily involved in a variety of Second Amendment cases involving the right to carry and restrictions on so-called assault weapons and large capacity magazines. Our third presenter today will be Deepak Gupta. He's a lecturer at Harvard Law School and the founding principal of Gupta Wessler PLLC in Washington, DC, where he specializes in appellate and complex litigation on a wide range of issues, including constitutional law, class actions, and consumers and workers' rights. Mr. Gupta regularly appears before the United States Supreme Court, and last year he became the first Asian American to argue before the court as an invited amicus curiae. He has handled appeals in every federal circuit and 11 state Supreme Courts, and has testified multiple times before the United States House of Representatives and the United States Senate. In the past few years, Mr. Gupta has been involved in several high profile Second Amendment cases. So without further ado, I welcome uh, Professor Smith to begin. Thank you, Judge. Um, thank you all for attending today. 2020, as you all know, has been a year of unprecedented upheaval and social unrest. We've experienced a pandemic, a hotly contested presidential election that continues today, and a series of mass protests. We've also seen mob violence, rioting, arson, and vandalism across the country. In response to that violence, ordinary citizens have sometimes been forced to defend their lives, their property, and their communities when the state and local authorities have failed to do so. The political violence, of course, is not new to our shores, but what is new is the refusal of certain political leaders to act to defend ordinary citizens, public property, and private property from violent actors. Now, formally, if a group of violent thugs came to destroy or loot your town, there would be a consensus across the political spectrum condemning such lawlessness. But this year, many political leaders have refused to take all available steps to quell the riots in places such as Portland, Seattle, Minneapolis, and Philadelphia. Now, as a result, ordinary Americans have felt the need to step in and defend their communities out of fear that their local officials will not do so. As a consequence, as one consequence, Americans have been buying firearms in record numbers, so much so that the FBI's National Instant Criminal Background Check System, or the NICS system, conducted over 28.8 million background checks for firearm purchases just between January and September of 2020. This figure exceeded by September the total figure of 28.4 million background check numbers, which consisted of the entirety of 2019. Now there's two recent and high profile examples that can be ripped from the headlines for us to review that uh, illustrate some further points. And that is the two recent and high profile examples of defense of life and property against rioters can be seen in the cases of Kyle Rittenhouse and Mark and Patricia McCloskey. In the Rittenhouse case, you had a 17 year old young man who traveled to neighboring Kenosha, Wisconsin to help protect the city from a night of royalty. Now, Ryan Rittenhouse was, you know, shot three mob members in what appears to be a, an act of self-defense. He was seen on camera before the shooting, working with a group of people to remove graffiti off a local building and appeared to be dis discussing his desire to render medical aid, if appropriate, at the time. At the same time, it's interesting, it appears that the prosecutor that's charging Rittenhouse uh, for murder has not pressed any, criti any criminal charges against the surviving attacker in that case. Likewise, let's take a look at another thing we've all been reading about this year, and that's the case of St. Louis attorneys Mark and Patricia McCloskey, who are now facing felony charges for the unlawful use of a weapon, firearms, from the very same local government officials who apparently failed to protect the McCloskey's neighborhood in the first place. In fact, the McCloskey's apparently felt the need to take up arms when individuals tore down a gate to their private community and allegedly approached their home in force, allegedly yelling death threats. Now, it's against this kind of uh, backdrop in the news that I want to propose something. I am proposing that the Second Amendment guarantees to Americans the right both individually and as part of a group the right to use firearms defensively to thwart violent threats. 
Now, this proposition of collective or group defense by ordinary Americans needs to be further explored in light of what we're seeing uh, on our TV screens now. Typically, if you think about it, Second Amendment issues are discussed usually in the context of a scenario where an individual is confronting a single attacker or possibly in kind of a theoretical concept or very generally uh, it's discussed um, as the importance of an armed citizenry thwarting government tyranny as another check on tyranny, which is what, of course, the constitutional document is all about. So the question today, uh, this morning, as I see it, is does the Second Amendment guarantee Americans the right, either individually or collectively, as part of a group to use firearms to defend their communities against mob violence and threats of mob violence? And I think the answer under the Second Amendment is yes, they do. So let's turn back and take a look at the analysis. If you go back to 2008, you have the Supreme Court's decision in Heller versus the District of Columbia. Heller holds that the scope of the Second Amendment is determined by the original meaning of its text and also by the Second Amendment's history and the tradition of the right to keep and bear arms, particularly as that right was understood at the time of the founding. Now, Heller's text, history, and tradition text supports my view that law-abiding citizens, citizens have a fundamental Second Amendment right to use armed force both individually and collectively with others in order to defend human life and property that is essential to the well-being of their communities from mob violence. So let's start where all good lawyers and judges should start. And well, that's where the text of the Constitution. Well, the text of the Second Amendment certainly establishes that the right to keep and bear arms extends outside the home. Now that's obvious from the Second Amendment's twin verbs, right? The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Well, if the provision meant to safeguard only a right to have firearms in your home, in your kitchen, protecting the right to keep arms would have been more than sufficient. But separately protecting a right to bear arms is read most naturally, in my view, as guaranteeing the distinct and equal right to carry firearms in public. It is also obvious from what the Second Amendment does not say, as they, as they say, uh, silence can often speak volumes. When a constitutional right only applies to specific places, it actually says so. Let's look at the Third Amendment. Well, the Third Amendment is specifically limited to quartering troops in quote unquote any house. Likewise, the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment is specifically limited to searches of persons, houses, papers, and effects. The Second Amendment contains no similar, similar limitation to the home. Finally, not only does the Second Amendment's operative text demonstrate that it applies outside the home, but the amendment's preamble, what Heller calls its prefatory clause, signals that one purpose behind the constitutional protection of the right to keep and bear arms is to ensure the security of a free state. Now, of course, we know from Heller that there's another purpose. The core purpose is uh, Mark, I believe uh, we lost Professor Smith there. Um, so uh, until we can get him back, uh, I think the thing to do is to move to uh, John Ollendorf. If, uh, if John, uh, you could uh, begin your presentation while we try to get Mark back. All right. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Judge Hardiman, and thank you for your introduction. And Thanks to the Federalist Society for uh, inviting me this morning. Um, the, the lockdown orders uh, that were imposed by nearly every state during the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic sparked a wide variety of constitutional litigation challenging uh, restrictions imposed, for example, on religious worship, uh, access to abortions, and critically here, the operation of such facilities as gun stores and gun ranges. And across the spectrum of these constitutional challenges, many states and many courts throughout the, the country turned to a previously obscure 115 year old case uh, to guide their analysis uh, uh, of constitutional challenges in a uh, time of a pandemic. And that case is uh, Jacobson versus Massachusetts decided in 1905. Um, in Jacobson, the plaintiff had challenged a Massachusetts uh, compulsory smallpox vaccination law uh, as violating various provisions of the 14th Amendment, as well as, uh, quote, the rights secured by the preamble to the Constitution of the United States, uh, 
and quote, the spirit of the constitution. Now, uh, pro tip, uh, so that all of you paying for CLE get your money's worth this morning. If you're involved in constitutional litigation and your strongest arguments are based on the constitution's preamble and spirit, your likelihood of success is not that high. And in fact, in Jacobson, uh, the Supreme Court did uphold Massachusetts uh, compulsory vaccination law. But the court noted in passing that, quote, if a statute purporting to have been enacted to protect the public health, the public morals, or the public safety has no real or substantial relation to those objects, or is beyond all question a plain palpable invasion of rights secured by the fundamental law, it is the duty of the courts to so adjudge and thereby give effect to the Constitution, close quote. Now, in this past year's uh, COVID-related litigation, this language I just quoted from Jacobson has been cited as effectively erecting a super tier of scrutiny that, uh, that trumps the ordinary tiers of scrutiny, strict scrutiny, intermediate, and rational basis review uh, when the government is defending a restriction imposed in time of a pandemic. Uh, it's been uh, repeatedly uh, relied upon by states defending their lockdown restrictions, and it's been repeatedly cited by courts, including by some justices of uh, the United States Supreme Court, although we heard uh, uh, some criticism last night from Justice Alito of that. Um, and, and I, too, want to argue this morning that this use of Jacobson, at least in the Second Amendment context, uh, is wrong and it is, uh, it is pernicious. And I'll begin with the claim that it's wrong. I think it's a, a doctrinal mistake to use the language uh, that I just quoted from Jacobson uh, to govern Second Amendment challenges uh, during the time of the coronavirus. And I think it's a mistake for three independent reasons. First, I think it's just not a, a faithful reading of Jacobson. Jacobson just nowhere purports to be establishing a super tier of pandemic scrutiny uh, that applies to all constitutional rights uh, across the board. Uh, instead, Jacobson dealt very narrowly with what today we would call a substantive due process challenge to Massachusetts vaccination law. And uh, as Justice Alito explained in a recent uh, dissent from denial, quote, it is a considerable stretch to read the decision as establishing the test to be applied when statewide measures of indefinite duration are challenged under the First Amendment or other provisions not at issue in that case. Uh, so I think it's not faithful to Jacobson uh, to read it in the way the courts have been this past year. And I think even if it were, uh, Jacobson also needs to be read in its historical context. Uh, Jacobson was decided in the height of the Lochner era, uh, an era when, of course, the, the Supreme Court embraced a form of constitutional jurisprudence that has since been broadly repudiated and, and widely recognized to have been out of step with the Constitution's original meaning in many ways. Uh, for one example, the, the Supreme Court did not begin to seriously enforce the First Amendment free speech right uh, until nearly six decades after Jacobson was handed down. And of course, Jacobson was uh, decided over a century before uh, District of Columbia versus Heller. So I think it's not only wrong, but also anachronistic uh, for courts to rely on Jacobson in the way that they have been. Um, and the citation of Heller uh, brings me to my third point, uh, which is that in, in that case, the Supreme Court very clearly established that the Second Amendment scope is determined by the text, history, and tradition test by looking at the provisions text, the, the, the history and traditions of the right to keep and bear arms. And I'm not aware of any historical evidence that Jacobson's pandemic super deference standard uh, was understood at the time of the founding or near the time of the founding to be a legitimate and traditional limit on the right to keep and bear arms. To the contrary, I think the evidence at least suggests that the Second Amendment is especially important uh, in times of crisis like, uh, like pandemics. Uh, so I think it's wrong to use Jacobson in the way that the courts have been. Uh, I also think it's dangerous, and I think it's dangerous in a way that sheds light on the danger that is also inherent in, in the routine use, even in ordinary times, of the so-called tiers of constitutional scrutiny in the Second Amendment context, strict scrutiny, intermediate scrutiny, or, or rational basis review. Now, I've written elsewhere about what I think are the many failings of the, the tiers of scrutiny approach, including in, uh, in the Second Amendment, and I won't rehearse the argument here, but what I do wanna highlight this morning is the extent to which I think Jacobson's scrutiny, 
as it's been used this last year, uh, both exemplifies and intensifies some of the problems with the tiers of scrutiny. So to begin with the first step of a scrutiny analysis, which is to determine right what, whether the government has advanced a sufficiently important or compelling interest in support of the challenge measure. Uh, so one, one difficulty with that inquiry is that judges simply have no scale on which to weigh government interests and sift the ones that are compelling from the ones that are important from the ones that are, I guess, unimportant. Uh, the Constitution certainly provides no ranking of government interests and the courts have not been able to articulate any principled basis for, uh, for coming up with such a ranking themselves. So in practice, what happens is courts often just end up deferring to the government's assertion that its interest in public safety or national security or public health uh, uh, is, is compelling one. And Jacobson scrutiny, I think, uh, starkly illustrates that problem. In, in the time of an ongoing worldwide pandemic, no court right is going to have the hardihood to reject the government's claim that it has a compelling interest in preventing the, the further spread of, of the virus. And my point is not that preventing the spread of the coronavirus is not important or compelling. Obviously it is compelling, but my point instead is that we are fooling ourselves if we think that, uh, that we are providing any meaningful check on the abuse of government power by asking courts to, to double check that, yep, sure enough, uh, the government's interest in and stopping the spread of the coronavirus is in fact a compelling one. Uh, so that's the first step of a scrutiny analysis. Let me move quickly to the, the second step, which is to judge the fit, uh, the fit or tailoring uh, of the challenge restriction to the government's asserted interests. And this is usually where most of the action is in the case law. Um, uh, but here too, I think uh, the use of Jacobson this past year uh, aptly illustrates the problems with this inquiry. Uh, so basically what we've, we've seen in the main is that courts have upheld COVID related restrictions and they've done so by explaining that they're not very well equipped to second guess the scientific or medical judgments made by the experts in the, in the state bureaucracy or the federal bureaucracy. Uh, and the problem is that that exact same competency argument applies with basically equal force to the great bulk of ordinary constitutional adjudication under the tiers of scrutiny. Determining the fit or tailoring uh, of, of a challenge law in virtually every uh, contested constitutional challenge basically depends on judgment calls and competing evaluations of uh, very complex uh, and very hotly contested scientific and empirical questions, such as whether restrictions on certain types of firearms uh, actually advance public safety or whether there are alternative restrictions that would advance public safety just as much, uh, but are, at least, are less intrusive. Uh, those, those types of questions uh, are often uh, dependent on evaluations of complex scientific or empirical judgments. And again, the point is not that, that judges are especially well equipped to decide those types of questions. I don't think they really are. Uh, but again, the point is that given the completely understandable judicial reluctance to second guess the political branches uh, determinations of these complex matters. Uh, again, I think we are fooling ourselves if we think that this tailoring prong adequately protects our fundamental constitutional rights. And the predictable result that we have seen uh, this past year is that, is that so far courts have basically upheld most COVID related restrictions and essentially uh, balanced away our constitutional rights found them outweighed by the government's interest in, in limiting the pandemic. I think that's a problem. I think the problem is heightened in, in, in the Jacobson context uh, because what Jacobson does is it effectively moves the goalposts closer, even closer to the line of scrimmage so that uh, they ensure that the government's going to win even if it couldn't prevail under a stricter intermediate scrutiny. Uh, so I think uh, that type of analysis is especially troubling. Uh, but I think uh, it, it's a difference in uh, degree, not a difference in kind. And I think the fundamental defects of this use of Jacobson uh, also infect the ordinary tiers of scrutiny analysis. And the result is that in, in workaday Second Amendment litigation too, in ordinary times, uh, courts, I think, have effectively balanced away our fundamental constitutional rights.
Thank you, Mr. Ohlendorf. Um, we, see, we see Professor Smith back with us, um, which is wonderful. Uh, so uh, if you were in the Court of Appeals, Professor, we would say that you have five minutes left on your light. So uh, please uh, resume. Uh, but but un but you need to unmute yourself. So beyond the text of the Second Amendment and how it establishes the right both of individuals and of individuals to come together as part of a group to protect their communities from violent threats by other groups, for example, uh, I'd like to move on to look at the history. Uh, so let's consider the act of collective community self-defense that sparked the American Revolutionary War, right? Let's go back to the beginning. The Battle of Lexington and Concord, specifically. Far from the type of battle you ordinarily picture when you hear that word, Lexington and Concord was not fought, at least on the American side, by an organized form of military unit. It was fought by ordinary members of the community, the celebrated minute men who mustered on public squares with, with their own arms, led and directed by leaders of the community, and they were acting collectively to defend the essential property of that community, which included fire, firearms and gunpowder. So the shot heard around the world uh, was fired in the context of acts of community self-defense, which is sort of an example of one of the things I'm talking about today. Because in addition to defending their homes, streets, and shops from the British, the early Americans had frequently found it necessary to engage in various other forms of armed defense, including uh, against attacks in Indian raids. Now, during the oral argument itself in Heller, now retired Justice Kennedy asked whether American colonists would have needed firearms to, quote, defend himself and his family against hostile Indian tribes and outlaws, wolves, bears, and grizzlies. Now, based on these remarks, it was pretty clear that Justice Kennedy was reaffirming the Second Amendment's intent to be enforced outside the home. And, you know, Justice Kennedy's understanding at the time made a lot of sense because under the existing English common law, which was in place there, you generally, uh, individuals had the right to defend their property against robbery, arson, and burglary, including by, including by using deadly force. And one famous example out of Pennsylvania, you know, founding father James Wilson and, and other men defended Mr. Wilson's home by using firearms against an armed mob. Now, James Wilson, by you, is no ordinary man in the 18th century. Wilson was a Supreme Court justice. He presided over the Pennsylvania Constitutional Convention of 1790 that adopted the following, quote, that the right of the citizens to bear arms in defense of themselves and the state shall not be questioned. Now, because the Second Amendment codifies a pre-existing right, Heller instructs that its protections are also informed to some degree by English understandings of the right to keep and bear arms and the right of self-defense at the time of the founding. And as Blackstone's commentaries explain, very important source, such homicide as is committed for the prevention of any forcible and atrocious crime is justifiable by the law of nature and also by the law of England. Further, as philosopher John Locke explained, whoever uses force without right puts himself into a state of war with those against whom he so uses it. And in that state, all former ties are canceled. All of their rights cease, and everyone has a right to defend himself and to resist the aggressor. And in some ways, most tellingly, we'd look to Sir William Hawkins, who wrote that the killing of dangerous riders by any private persons who cannot otherwise suppress them or defend themselves from them was justifiable homicide. So it is, in my view, this historical understanding directly applies to community defense using firearms against today's rioters and looters. Just like an individual's home is special because it is necessary to his safety and well-being, a community's main street is equally essential to the health, vibrancy, and well-being of the community. And just like a home invader has restored the state of nature between himself and his intended victim, justifying armed self-defense on the part of the victim, so too, when violent riders descend upon a community intent on burning it down and destroying it, they too have restored the state of nature between themselves and that community, justifying armed self-defense to resist and stop the aggressors. Now, this is especially true when the governing authorities have abdicated their responsibility to keep the public peace. Remember, Americans have not and do not surrender fundamental individual rights, including the right to armed self-defense when they delegate, delegate limited powers to form a government but a state that refuses to or cannot provide protection to its citizens is a failed state, in essence, leaving its citizens with every right to take appropriate measures to defend their communities. Now, to conclude, 
The text, history, and tradition of the Second Amendment show that there is a constitutional Second Amendment right, both for individuals and as part of a community to defend against violent attacks. Here, I think the First Amendment's right to petition the government for a redress is an appropriate analogy. That right to petition can be exercised both individually, but it can also be exercised as part of a group. Likewise, the Second Amendment's right to keep and bear arms can be exercised individually, and it can be exercised as part of a group. So I wish to make one larger point here as I conclude. Modern constitutional jurisprudence assumes that in times of great peril, the government has the legal authority to expand its police powers in the name of some public emergency. I would argue that in the case of the Second Amendment's right to keep and bear arms, and in the context of a public emergency, the authority of the government to act and restrict Second Amendment rights should actually be more limited rather than more expansive. Indeed, the right to keep and bear arms is specifically designed to guarantee that ordinary citizens have the means of self-protection, especially in times of public danger. Thus, the government should have less authority to restrict this right in a time of an emergency. And while we would much prefer, and I would certainly prefer, that local government officials do their job of maintaining civil order, it has become increasingly clear that that is no longer a guaranteed outcome. So when the police cannot or will not show up to protect us in our communities, it really falls to ordinary law-abiding Americans to step up and defend their homes and their hometowns when no one else will do. To, will do. Now, the answers to the constitutional questions I've raised today will decide whether we will enjoy the peaceful use of our homes and neighborhoods in the future. Thank you. And um, I believe I'm now introducing uh, Mr. Gupta. So Mr. Gupta. Hi, uh, well, thank you, uh, Judge Hardiman and the other panelists and thanks to um, FedSoc for inviting me to be here. Uh, I'm sorry we're not all together at the Mayflower Hotel. Um, I particularly at this moment in, in, in our history, which I think is a dark moment, as it's been a difficult moment, I was looking forward to, to being able to speak to um, smart uh, conservatives and lawyers about um, what we make of the, the topic of this conference, which is the rule of law in crisis. And uh, just when we were getting ready to come on, I asked uh, Dean Reuter, well, what do you mean by the crisis? It seems like we're experiencing several different uh, crises at once. Um, and I think the previous speakers have touched on them, um, or at least two of them. We're experiencing, um, of course, this, this uh, global pandemic. Um, and uh, we've experienced maybe um, that the United States is dealing with this um, worse than perhaps any industrialized developed nation. The richest nation in the world has failed utterly at the national level to deal with this pandemic and we have more deaths than any other nation. And we're also struggling to deal with how we safeguard our tradition of civil liberties and civil rights in a, in a pandemic, how we balance um, competing values. And I think those are very difficult um, constitutional questions that are that are worthy, very worthy of discussion. Um, we've also experienced um, uh, racial um, uh, unrest and, and um, a protest about racial justice that harkens back to the late 1960s. Um, Professor Smith um, uh, referenced that in, in his comments. Um, and I think the third crisis is the one that um, is the most recent perhaps, but we, we can view Donald Trump's presidency itself as a crisis, but I think now we're experiencing um, special pressure on the rule of law and our constitutional democracy um, surrounding the transition. And I, I do think there's an intersection between um, the kind of concerns about uh, mob violence uh, with guns and this latest crisis, because we have a president that has um, consistently promoted uh, violence. He has uh, used the Second Amendment not to talk about the serious, serious constitutional questions, but instead um, to, to promote um, violence. And there are militia groups that have said that they will um, take action on the president's orders in, in ways that are particularly troubling. I, I hope um, our worst fears about that are all alarmist and we will have a peaceful transition as we always have had. Um, but I think all of those kinds of concerns are implicated in today's topic and, and, and it's a really rich uh, topic. So I, I I, at the risk of being too ambitious, I want to try to take on um, both sets of comments and particularly to address 
um, what we do about constitutional values in a, in a pandemic, constitutional rights in a pandemic, and um, also the question of um, uh, guns in the, in the streets and the public carrying of guns. Um, so to start out, um, you know, I think we have seen in very short order, a kind of pandemic constitutional law emerge. And it's really been remarkable to me see, to, to me to see how it's arisen um, with respect to kind of the full spectrum of hot button constitutional issues. Um, we're talking here about guns, but it's also come up in the context of religion, prisoners' rights, abortion, and voting. Um, and um, the, it raises profound unsettled questions about how you balance um, the ability of the state to protect the people um, versus individual constitutional rights. Um, and of course, we live in a time where it seems like everything uh, becomes a constitutional controversy. But pandemics are not new. Uh, quarantine laws go back to the 14th century in, in Italy and Croatia um, when people were dealing with the Black Death and tuberculosis. Presidents John Adams and Thomas Jefferson sought to use the Commerce Clause um, to uh, deal with, um, with outbreaks um, through quarantines. And Chief Justice John Marshall, in his um, opinion in uh, Gibbons versus Ogden, referred to inspection laws, quarantine laws, and health laws of every description, to quote him, as subject to state um, legislation and in some limited circumstances subject to national um, legislation as well. So um, the Jacobson opinion from 1905 um, that John talked about has become kind of the touchstone of this discussion. But, you know, I actually agree with a lot of what John said that um, I think maybe too much has been made of Jacobson, the attempt to impose onto Jacobson a kind of framework that will solve these difficult problems is probably too much for Jacobson to bear. After all, this is a decision from 1905 that predates uh, a lot of the, the, the 20th century's development in, in civil liberties and civil rights law. And um, the, the constitutional claim that was being raised by Mr. Jacobson in, in opposition to Cambridge, Massachusetts's um, vaccination law was a pretty feeble um, constitutional claim. But I do think Jake's, Jacobson has something um, to teach us. And I think, you know, I basically um, would align myself with what Chief Justice Roberts has said, uh, very little uh, has been said, but he said something about Jacobson. And um, I think the, Supreme, the only Supreme Court case that really provides us with some guidance about this is the, is the Chief Justice's decision in a case called South Bay United Pentecostal Church versus Newsom, which was a case where um, folks in California were challenging pandemic restrictions as applied to um, church services, where there were numer numerical restrictions um, based on public occupancy. And what, what the chief said is that the precise question of when restrictions on activity should be lifted during a pandemic is in his words, a dynamic and fact intensive matter subject to reasonable disagreement. Our constitution, he says, and he's quoting Jacobson, entrusts the safety and health of the people to the politically accountable officials of the state to guard and protect. And when they do that, the, the, and it's not just the chief, this is an opinion of the Supreme Court, it says when they, when they undertake to act in these areas fraught with medical and scientific uncertainties, their latitude, he says, must be especially broad. Now, what does that mean? As I said, I don't think it's a framework. I think maybe the best way to understand it is the same way we understand the kind of deference that we afford uh, prison officials in uh, Eighth Amendment cases. That is, there's an understanding that officials that are dealing with difficult, dynamic, fact-intensive problems um, should, uh, should get some deference from the courts because unelected judges are not in a very good position to second guess all of the fact-based judgments that those officials make. But on the other hand, uh, I don't think any of us would agree that uh, all civil rights and civil liberties go out the window in a pandemic or that there's no way to appropriately challenge um, restrictions imposed by state authorities. So there still has to be some kind of framework. And I, I think, you know, as with so much about Second Amendment law, we don't know very much about the content. The Supreme Court has acknowledged the right and set it in motion in, in Heller, incorporated it to the states 
in McDonald and then said very little uh, more about the content of the of the right. And it's mostly been fleshed out in the in the lower courts. But one thing that Heller made clear is that the right is not unlimited, that the right is subject to uh, qualifications and limitations, and that we know where those limitations come from by looking at the historical scope of the of the right. And one uh, kind of qualification or limitation that, that Justice Scalia identified in the Heller opinion what were limitations on the commercial sale of firearms. So I think it's worth looking at how courts have dealt with challenges to limitations on the uh, commercial sale of firearms in the non-pandemic context to try to inform how we should understand these challenges during the pandemic. And I think um, I would point folks to, to opinions by two prominent conservative appellate judges, uh, both from the Ninth Circuit, Judge Bea and Judge Bybee, who dealt with um, questions of this kind. And when, when they dealt with these questions, with these challenges to commercial sale, they drew upon a principle that I think is pretty familiar in our constitutional law, which is a principle of general applicability. In the free exercise context, uh, at least until now, the law has been that when a, a state imposes a restriction that is generally applicable, that's not, that is not targeted against religion or not motivated by animus against religion, that that restriction would be, will be upheld even if it has some incidental effect that burdens um, religion. And while the Chief Justice didn't cite Employment Division versus Smith in his uh, South Bay opinion, I think he had to have had a principle like that in mind because his reasoning, and, and I think this reasoning stands independent of his discussion of Jacobson, is that um, these restrictions in California were okay because uh, in his words, similar or more severe restrictions applied to comparable secular gatherings, including lectures, concerts, movie showings, spectator sports, and theatrical performances where large groups of people gathered in close proximity for extended periods of time. So he was doing what we do when we do a kind of conventional Smith analysis, which is to, um, to try to figure out what the relevant comparisons are between restrictions on churches and restrictions on, on other kinds of secular uh, enterprises and, and ensured that the restriction applied equally. And so I think that is basically, although the chief didn't say so, is basically a Smith analysis. And I think if we look at these decisions um, by Judge Bea and Judge Bybee from the Ninth Circuit, we see the same thing. Judge Bea said that in his words, a measure of general application, I'm quoting from him, that affects stores of any kind um, and not just gun stores would not raise a Second Amendment issue. Judge Bybee similarly said in a case called Pena versus Lindley that I worked on, he wrote that, quote, rules of general applicability don't raise uh, don't violate the Second Amendment just because they place conditions on the sales of handguns used for self-defense. We accept such restrictions on our rights, including our fundamental rights to speak, publish, and exercise our religion, because laws of general applicability cover a broad range of activities and hence must have broad popular acceptance and support. Now, notice Judge Bea and Judge Bybee, they're talking about laws of general applicability in normal times, not in a pandemic. So this isn't a principle that even relies on the Jacobson concept that state and local officials get special deference for these kinds of public health policies in a pandemic. And so I think the challengers in these kinds of cases, and we will probably see more of them if there are additional lockdowns and restrictions, I think they face really difficult hurdles because I think first they have to surmount this concept of general applicability. And I'm, I'm not convinced they can, but I think that would be a fact um, intensive and case specific analysis that would turn on whether the restrictions are truly even handed or whether there's some indication of animus. And then second, I think the courts are going to have to give special deference um, to state and local restrictions in a, in a pandemic. Um, courts are not going to, I think, use the same kind of analysis they would use in normal times when we're dealing with, you know, emergency restrictions that are designed to to, con to contain the spread of a deadly virus. And so, um, you know, the devil may be in the details, but I think that those challenges are going to have a hard time um, succeeding. Now, I'm, I'm running short on time, but I do wanna just take issue with some of the things that Mark said, because I, I found 
um, the comments troubling. And I, I hope I'm misunderstanding um, the argument, but I hope what we're not saying here is that we would condone um, vigilantism by groups in place of um, policing by the state. I think um, the Second Amendment question is not whether the Second Amendment uh, applies outside the home. I think Mark is right that when you look at the text of the Second Amendment, um, keep suggests rights in the home, bear suggests uh, carrying. I think the relevant question instead is what is the scope of the Anglo-American right that is being protected by the, the Second Amendment? We know from Heller that the core right, in Justice Scalia's words, is the right of law-abiding responsible citizens to use arm, arms in defense of hearth and home. Um, but we also know from the history, there's a rich Anglo-American history dating back to at least the statute of Northampton of 1328, um, where um, we know that it was forbidden for anyone to ride armed by night or by day in fairs, markets, or in, in other public places. And so there is a long history from, from 1328 onwards into the early American Republic where the statute of Northampton was incorporated as part of the common law. And then that gave rise to statutes like uh, the Massachusetts model statute of where there's a good cause. Um, if there's a good cause, a license is given, but if not, public carry can be restricted. And I have um, written several briefs on, on these issues, both in the lower court and the Supreme Court. And I think before the Supreme Court takes up the question of the extent to which the Second Amendment applies outside the home, um, we should first have more ventilation in the lower courts about those historical arguments because they don't rely on um, the application of means and scrutiny. They, they are text uh, and history-based arguments that I think um, we have to grapple with in order to understand the, the scope of the right that's protected by the Second Amendment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Gupta. Uh, Professor Smith, uh, do you want to respond to, uh, since um, Mr. Gupta uh, referred to you specifically? Uh, sure, I think uh, there's just three points I would like to make. First of all, I think if you look at the Smith case of general applicability of law, that illustrates my point of how in the second amendment context of the right to keep and bear arms, it's unique. And what I mean by that is Smith, of course, says that the law is generally applicable across all similar circumstances, uh, that it's not viewed as discrimination if it sort of, you know, affects, let's say, a religious belief or whatnot. But my argument here is that the Second Amendment is a little bit like a fire extinguisher, right? You, you need to break it in case of emergency. And as a consequence, when you're dealing with times of public stress, public disorder, a natural disaster, whatever it is that places tremendous stress on the civil authorities, it behooves Americans in their individual capacity as citizens to step up to protect themselves in their communities where the civil authorities are either unable or unwilling to do so. And I think that actually, I would make the case that the Second Amendment uniquely is an except would be an exception to the Smith general applicability rule because in those times of stress the second amendment is uniquely needed by Americans to protect themselves their families and their communities so I would say that unlike other rights perhaps the right to meet and, and, and engage in religious practices the right to speak out uh, and those other rights I would say that the second amendment actually works in reverse where it needs to be protected more than ever before in the context of some sort of civil unrest or, or pandemic or dangerous situation. The second thing is, no, I'm not advocating for vigilantism because vigilantism, to be very precise, is this. Vigilantism is that someone has done something wrong and the community takes it upon themselves to punish them after the fact. No, my argument is different. And I think if you think about what the second one really is about, okay, the old saying is when seconds count, police are minutes away. Now that is not to denigrate law and order, it's not to denigrate police. It's a practical reality of the human experience that many times we humans encounter some emergency situation. And that's why I've written several times 
that whether you like it or not, we as people are really the true first responders because it is we who come across the sick person. It is we that come across the criminal. It is we that come across the fire and we have to address it first, including but not limited to calling 911. So really the civil authorities are almost always the second man on the scene. So we are the first responders. And if you want to prevent, and what I'm interested about mostly, and I think what the Second Amendment is mostly interested in, is not punishment. It's not about punitive behavior. What it's about is preventative behavior. It's about stopping the person from getting killed in the first place. It's about stopping the town from being burned down before it occurs. And I think that's what the Second Amendment is about. It has nothing to do with vigilantism. And again, if your home is under attack by violent people that want to do harm illegally and immorally, then you obviously have a second amendment right to step up and stop that. You don't have to wait for, frankly, you to be dead and have a chalk line around your body. That's not really helpful. And I think the third point is, um, Mr. Gupta was always very articulate. He did make a point about let the lower courts make these decisions about text history and tradition first and let it percolate up to the Supreme Court. I actually don't think that works. Um, the reason why I don't think that works is if you look at the courts that here and adjudicate Second Amendment cases, they tend to be in the same jurisdictions that have robust, robust gun restrictions and gun laws. So what you really have is I would call sort of a biased sample set of bad jurisprudence because all of these cases in the lower courts come out of New York. They come out of San Francisco. They come out of Chicago. So you're really only seeing a, a body of jurists that have a tendency to have politics and viewpoints similar to the politicians that have appointed them. So you're not getting Second Amendment cases out of Texas. You're not getting them out of Alabama. You're not getting them out of these jurisdictions that are sort of more gun friendly. And as a consequence, I think if you let the lower courts sort of address and analyze the history without the Supreme Court guidance, I think you're really getting a skewed sample set. And I don't think that's particularly helpful to achieving a, a truth and where we need to be in the jurisprudence. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Professor Smith. Mr. Gupta, brief response. Sure. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm glad to hear Professor Smith say that he's not endorsing vigilantism, and I certainly didn't want to mischaracterize his argument. But I, you know, one concern I have is just that um, one man's um, mob is another man's uh, sort of legitimate group of uh, citizens ensuring law and order. And I, you know, I, I, what, what I'm concerned about is not um, the, the person who is um, uh, at defending their home um, with a firearm. As I said, I think Heller stands for the, the core proposition that, that is, that's at the core of the Anglo-American Second Amendment right. Instead, uh, my concern is the suggestion that um, you know, armed bands of, of citizens, and you could have competing armed bands of citizens, that that is what's contemplated by the Second Amendment. And I think, you know, I think uh, Professor Smith is making um, a, a powerful argument, but it sounds to me more like an argument um, from first principles of political philosophy than a, a legal argument. And, and I think, uh, you know, those of us who are judges and lawyers who need to uh, operate under the fr Heller framework and answered these questions should treat them as legal questions and we should start with the legal materials. And the text of the Second Amendment is not going to answer all of these questions. And so I think, you know, what Heller has told us to do is to use the toolkit of history um, and tradition to understand uh, how to answer these questions. And the questions aren't new. Um, there have always been uh, questions about, about violence and uh, the extent to which the state has a, a monopoly on violence. And I think it's fair to say that the, the English Declaration of Rights, um, which came after the Statute of Northampton um, and with which the Statute of Northampton coexisted, recognized that the state does not have a complete monopoly on, on weapons, but it also um, recognizes that, um, that the state has a legitimate role in, in preventing and regulating, preventing um, violence on the streets and in regulating violence on the streets. And there's nothing new about that. Even in the wild west in America, um, we had uh, ordinances at the local level and law uh, that was um, pr more permissive than the statute of Northampton, but still restrictive and more like the, the laws that are at issue um, in these second amendment challenges. 
Um, so I, I would just urge that we treat the question as a, as a legal question. And, and then a final, just quick response. Um, uh, Professor Smith said that, um, you know, there are the, the law reflects the, the nature and politics of the jurisdictions. So in urban areas on the coasts, there might be different views about these matters than in, um, say, the, the Midwest or the South. And I, I would just say that's the beauty of our federalism. I think um, the political branches are going to make different judgments in different parts of the country based on the views of the electorate. And that's totally appropriate. Um, the question is, you know, when do those political judgments uh, by the elected branches contravene um, constitutional limitations? And the best way to understand those constitutional limitations is through the, the traditions um, and history um, that, we, that we get from Anglo-American um, understandings of the right. Thank you. All right, let me give uh, uh, John Ollendorf a chance to, to chime in. We do have several questions queued up, so I wanna wrap this portion up in the next uh, three or four minutes. Mr. Ollendorf? Yeah, thanks, thanks, I'll be brief. Turn, turning from one crisis to another, I, I do wanna just make a couple points in response to, to Deepak's uh, very thoughtful comments. Um, so first, I'm, I'm glad we, uh, I think, basically read Jacobson uh, pretty much the same way. And I, um, and I agree also with, with Deepak that, uh, you know, the, the, the medical efficacy uh, of, of coronavirus restrictions is a, uh, is a uh, dynamic, it's a contested, it's a complex question and judges are not that well equipped to second guess determinations about those kinds of questions. But I think we draw different conclusions from that. Deepak draws the conclusion that that means judges should be deferential. I draw the conclusion that means we're asking the wrong question in the first place uh, if, we're, if we're actually trying to provide some kind of meaningful check on government power in the time of a pandemic. Um, and I think this is I think this is really nicely captured right by by Deepak's uh, reference to the deference that's accorded prison officials. Um, I think it's it's you know it's it's a little troubling I think uh, the the implication of that that uh, that all of society uh, is in sort of the same kind of weakened constitutional profile that that prisoners are during the time of a pandemic. Um, I think that just highlights the extent to which this is, uh, we've gone down kind of the wrong, the wrong road here. Um, uh, Deepak suggested that the, the analysis should, uh, should be similar to the one in the Smith case, Employment Division versus Smith. Um, just like I think the, uh, the use of Jacobson uh, is an indictment of, uh, of the ordinary uh, tiers of scrutiny, I think that suggestion is an indictment of Smith. Um, uh, for a couple reasons. First, I think the, the suggestion that our prized constitutional liberties, the, the, right to, the right to freedom of speech, religious liberty, the right to keep and bear arms, uh, uh, should be put in the same uh, profile as uh, the right to buy liquor uh, or uh, you know, the right to go to a convenience store. Um, I, that seems wrong to me. I think these constitution, if, if, if the constitutional enumeration of these rights means anything, it, it means that they should be in a preferential position. And second, even if you're going to do the Smith type analysis, I think it has to have some teeth. And I think in particular, the chief justice's uh, uh, use of that, uh, of that type of analysis in, in the South Bay case, with all due respect, uh, was sort of toothless. Um, I, I think what you have to do if you're going to do that kind of analysis is actually ask, is the state uh, uh, treating equivalent uh, types of activities in an equivalent way and where the state is, uh, is forbidding religious worship, but it allows, uh, you know, numberless children to gather in a daycare or allows numberless people to gather in a casino. Um, I think uh, judges should call foul on that, and I don't think it, uh, I don't think you need any deference or lack of deference to call foul on that. And if uh, if uh, if people are allowed to go to convenience stores and liquor stores, but they're not allowed to go to gun stores, again, I think deference or no, um, if we're going to do the Smith type of analysis, we should at least do it with a, a little bit of a, a critical and realistic eye. Thank you. Uh, do you want to respond in 30 seconds, uh, Mr. Gupta, before we go to questions or are we okay? Sure. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to do a quick response. I, you know, I'm surprised at how much we, we actually agree on. John and I agree um, on, on quite a lot. And I think it's almost the devil is in the details. And, you know, I, my firm and I, we represented um, uh, prisoners um, in some of these challenges early in the pandemic um, to, um, to situations in prisons where we thought that, that prisoners were, um, were being exposed to the coronavirus without adequate uh, precautions. So, you know, I think one of the beauties of uh, the beautiful thing about constitutional law is that we have to arrive collectively at neutral principles. We don't get to pick our favorite rights. And, um, you know, I think as we work through these problems, I think um, it sounds like, you know, we can all agree that it can't just be a thumb on the scale just because it's a pandemic. Um, we all agree that neutrality has to be a meaningful inquiry. And so if there's really animus, I, I think I agree with you, John, if, you know, if the, if the if comparable um, entities are not being tr treated uh, similarly, then that's a problem. But I don't think, um, you know, ultimately a bookstore um, should be able to say that it's a, a violation of the First Amendment um, if, if all, uh, all businesses non-essential businesses are being shut down for a temporary period of time to prevent the spread of the virus. Um, and so, um, you know, I think what I hope we arrive at, and maybe we can agree to some degree on this, is, is, a, is a constitutional law where um, courts are doing meaningful scrutiny, um, but leaving room for, for truly generally applicable public health uh, measures that, that we should all agree are necessary. Thank you. All right. The, uh, for those getting CLE credit, your password is BMG18. That's Bravo, Mary, George, 18. Our first question, uh, and please, no speeches, just questions, goes to Jonathan Mitchell. Mr. Mitchell, uh, please unmute your mic, Mr. Mitchell, as well. Hi, my question's primarily for Deepak Gupta, but I'm interested in what all the panelists think of this. I'm struck by the fact that the Second Amendment with its text is phrased as an absolute. It says after the prefatory clause, quote, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, end quote. And if the subject matter of the Second Amendment involved something other than gun ownership, it's clear to me that liberal judges and lawyers would interpret this language as creating an absolute right. Just imagine if the Second Amendment said, quote, a woman's right to reproductive autonomy being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to obtain and perform abortions shall not be infringed, end quote. I mean, if the Second Amendment said that, then every liberal judge in the United States would interpret that as an absolute right that allows for no regulation whatsoever, even in a pandemic, and even pursuant to laws of general applicability. And in fact, liberal judges are already doing that even though they have no text in the Constitution along the lines that I've just described. They're not basing it on what Constitution says or what history says, but on their own notions of normatively desirable policy. So here's my question. How is it possible for a left-leaning lawyer or judge to say that it is legally correct for judges to interpret the non-textual right to abortion as an absolute or as a near absolute to the point that even in a pandemic, they won't allow restrictions on that right even pursuant to rules of general applicability, and then yet simultaneously say that it is legally incorrect for a conservative jurist to interpret the Second Amendment broadly, especially when, number one, you know, the right to keep and bear arms, unlike the right to abortion, can actually be found in the Constitution's text. And number two, the text of the Second Amendment seems to indicate that the right to keep and bear arms is absolute and is not subject to balancing tests. How are those two positions logically compatible with each other? Thank you, uh, Jonathan. And, and I'm sorry we won't be able to chat afterwards. It's good to see you, um, hear from you. Uh, you know, I think it's an excellent question. And I think it, it just points up the, the, one of the last points I was making, which is that um, you know, the beauty of law, what makes law different from politics, is that it has to, be, it has to consist of neutral principles where like cases are treated alike. And, and um, you know, I'm not sure that there are any truly absolute constitutional rights, at, le at least when we're talking about civil rights and civil liberties. I wouldn't necessarily align myself with Justice Black's view of the, of the First Amendment. And with respect to the Second Amendment, I think we know um, that it is not quite absolute in the way that your question maybe suggests, 
um, at least if we operate under the Supreme Court's existing jurisprudence, I think, you know, Justice Scalia says the Second Amendment, in, in, in his words, is, quote, not unlimited. That is um, page 626 of Heller. He says, we do not read the Second Amendment to protect the right of citizens to carry arms for any sort of confrontation or to keep and carry any we weapon whatsoever in any manner for any purpose. And again, he, you know, as I said earlier, he identifies these longstanding limitations um, by reference to Anglo-American history. And so I think, um, as I mentioned in the sort of pre-pandemic cases, I think the pre-pandemic cases maybe just resolve the issue because the Supreme Court has already, already recognized that restrictions on the commercial sale of firearms, um, at least were generally applicable, um, th th that those things are permissible. But I think, you know, I think that the thrust of your question is um, you know, that we ought to be looking to see whether judges are being hypocritical and preferring some rights over others. Um, because if they're, if they're doing that and they're not applying the same sort of constitutional principles um, simply because they like one right and don't like the other, then, then you know, they're open to the charge that they're not doing law. And, um, and you know, I think it has been um, interesting to see how these cases have played out in different areas of rights. I hope the court will arrive at some kind of generally applicable framework. Great. Our next question is from Christina Danapolis. Your question, uh, please unmute your mic. Did we lose Christina? We can't hear you if you're there. All right, we'll go to the next question. Adam Winkler, please unmute your mic. Thank you so much. I hope you can hear me now. Um, uh, we my, can. Question, my question relates to the history and tradition, and it may go to the question that was just asked too about um, why this right is not an absolute right. When we think about the history and tradition of test in the Second Amendment, one of the things that seems to be overlooked for the most part, but I'm curious how the panelists would think about how we should integrate it into the analysis, which is the long history and tradition of judicial deference to legislatures when it comes to gun regulation. Um, we have, uh, you know, even if we go back to the right to bear arms under state constitutional law, we have well over 100 years of, uh, of nearly uniform state and state law constitutional interpretation of the right to bear arms to uh, apply only a reasonable regulation test that allows lawmakers uh, to uh, great leeway to regulate guns uh, so long as they don't completely deny the right to keep and bear arms. Um, and so I'm just curious how we think about when thinking about uh, as we move forward with this history and tradition test, uh, which often focuses on uh, is there a history and tradition of this particular type of regulation that we've ever seen? Um, and I'm just curious how we think about the more general question of the history and tradition of broad legislative authority to regulate guns and how do we factor that into our history and tradition analysis? Per, uh... Okay, John's raising his hand, so go ahead. And, and uh, anyone else who wants to respond to that good question? Thank you, uh, Professor Winkler. Go ahead, John. Yeah, so uh, uh, that's a great question. And I wanna start by uh, taking issue with the, the piece of history and tradition that Deepak has mentioned a couple times, which is the statute of Northampton. Um, and Deepak and I have traded many uh, dueling briefs uh, over how to read that statute and the, and the following case law, and I hope we have the opportunity to do so again uh, in, in the future. Um, but suffice it to say, I think uh, uh, what Deepak offered is a very one-sided view of at, at what that statute, at least how that statute was enforced around the time of the founding. Um, the statute was enacted in 1328, so obviously it's very old. Um, but uh, by the late 17th century, uh, there was a famous case, uh, Sir John Knight's case, which read it as at that point, uh, the King's Bench, the uh, Justice Holt said it is basically gone into desuetude, um, except to the extent that a person carrying firearms is doing so with ill intent. Um, and uh, you see the same principle reflected in contemporary commentators. Um, and uh, I think also if you move to this side of, uh, of, the, uh, of the Atlantic, um, uh, it's important to look at how the types of restrictions, of early restrictions that Deepak and, and Adam are talking about were enforced on the ground. And I encourage uh, anyone interested in this to look up on SSRN, uh, a recent paper by uh, 
uh, professor uh, Leiter, Robert Leiter at George Mason, which uh, looks at the really lack of, um, of meaningful enforcement or any evidence of, of meaningful enforcement of these types of laws, at least as to ordinary carrying by people uh, for purposes of self-defense. Now, uh, Adam's question in particular about the, the reasonable regulation standard, that that's, that standard reasonable regulation was of course in you know, the, the mid to late 18th century, kind of the predominant standard across the board in, in constitutional law. I don't know that it was faithful to, uh, to founding principles, but it certainly was not treating second amendment rights any differently than any other constitutional rights. That was kind of the go-to standard by state and federal courts at the time. And if you look at the, at the cases from the 1830s, 40s, 50s, uh, what you see is uh, they, they do uphold many types of restrictions. For example, restrictions on, con on, uh, on concealed carry of firearms, but they lay down very clear uh, markers that what you can't do is in regulating the right reasonably, uh, you can't eclipse the right. You can't, uh, you can't go to the core of the right and forbid the right from being exercised in some manner by law-abiding citizens. And when states uh, do that, like the state of Georgia did that, then the courts strike those laws down. Okay, okay. Deep, yep, we'll go to Deepak and then we'll go to, then we'll go to Mark. Okay, and uh, really unfortunately, we, unfortunately, we have to end promptly at 12.15, so we have about four minutes left. Go ahead, Deepak. I'll, I'll try to be really quick. So, uh, you know, um, thanks, uh, Adam uh, Winkler, for the excellent question. And I do want to plug his book, Gunfight, which is a, a terrific, entertaining, um, and I think balanced read of the history of these, uh, uh, among other things, of the kind of regulation that we're talking about here. Um, now, obviously, we can't we can't summarize the whole debate that John and I have about the the statute of Northampton here. Uh, you can look at our our briefs coming soon to a court near you um, to see how that how that debate uh, plays out. But but I do think it's the right debate to be having um, under Heller. Um, now that that debate has to do with specific analogies of the of the regulation that's in question at the first step of the analysis. And in most of the courts and the lower courts, I think all of them actually, you have a two step analysis. You first asked is this within the, the scope of the Anglo-American right based on history and tradition? And then if it is, if there's a burden on the right, um, you perform uh, intermediate scrutiny. And I think the right way to think about the role of regulation generally, which, which is what Adam is asking about, is that that comes in at the second step. So that even if you don't have um, a well-established long-standing tradition that takes that regulation outside the scope of the, the second amendment right, there's still a role to play in, in deferring to and analyzing the objectives that the state has in, in, in protecting people against gun violence. Professor Smith, a brief comment? Uh, although I always enjoy Adam's excellent work, uh, I'm gonna weigh my right so that somebody else can ask the final question. All right. Um, uh, for those of you getting CLE, again, the code is BMG18. And uh, we have two minutes to hear from Sylvia Ross. Are uh, you there, Sylvia? Can you unmute your mic and give us a very quick question? And we'll try to give you a very quick answer. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, it was very good. I'll, I do have a question. It has to do with basic philosophy. Um, there were three quick. Without a natural law understanding of uh, or the laws of nature of nature's God, how can we even understand the second amendment properly or interpreting any of the constitutional amendments? The second, that's my first question. Second is how do we avoid all things pandemic being used as an excuse to overreach on everything? And finally, I'm not, how do, if we keep calling things a legal question, and I understand there's a need that there are legal questions, but how will that ever help us understand um, that are there not always a political and a legal philosophy conjoined in making the answers on particularly Second Amendment issues? Thank you. All right, Mark, Mark you want to handle yeah. those in well, 60 well, seconds? Well, first of all, I'm a proponent of you know, natural rights philosophies. Um, so I think there's a lot to be said for that. But I really think that all American constitution uh, law should be infused with the notion of, are we as American subjects or are we citizens? If we're subjects, well, that's one thing. But if we're citizens, then at the end of the day, we're responsible for our health and our well-being, and the government is there to supplement it, but not replace it. 
Now, as to the question of how do you deal with a pandemic and legal versus political questions, I actually think this is a very important distinction that has been lost in the last eight months, and that's this. It's one thing if a legislature, through legislative action, passes a bill by both chambers, it goes to the governor to be signed or vetoed with and overrode. It's one thing for there to be a statute that shuts down the entire economy of, let's say, Michigan. To me, it's a far different situation where you allow a governor to have an executive order that says, I find there's an emergency because three MDs that I'm friendly with tell me there's an emergency, and now I shut down an entire state. And I do think that any of these robust regulations, restrictions, shutdowns should really only be done through the legislative process and not by waiving our reference to a 1952 statute and saying, I've got emergency powers of the executive. I don't think that's how it should go down. And that's part of the problem here, that these shutdowns have been done through executive order and the wave of a pen and not through proper legislative means. And then that, I think, has given rise to a lot of unnecessary tension today. Terrific. Well, a great question from Sylvia and a, and a great answer from Mark. Uh, I'm sorry we can't uh, give this distinguished panel the uh, rousing applause to which they are richly entitled, but you can just assume that everyone out in cyberspace is giving you the, the jazz hands or whatever. So I'm very grateful uh, for this group. Um, and uh, Hopefully next year we will all be uh, together in person to enjoy the fellowship even more. Thank you again for all uh, of our panelists and for all those in attendance. Good afternoon.